Uh, pop music short for popular. Um, what Mozart was, One Direction is. And clearly we'll be talking about One Direction in 200 years' time. You would think. You would think. Let me just read a Wikipedia, which is the font of all knowledge, obviously. Who writes that? Who writes that? Really clever people. <laughs> this is what they say about pop music. There are core elements which define pop. Some include generally short to medium length songs, written in a basic format, often the verse chorus structure, as well as a common employment of repeated choruses, melodic tunes, and catchy hooks. My first question, you guys, is. What do you think a pop song is? Oh, God, it's really difficult. Um, well, I mean, in its absolute personal terms, it's something that's popular. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of work with a lot of people who have a fear of writing pop because they don't want to be a pop act or, a, I don't know, it's sort of uncool or, you know, usually, especially. Anybody who's been in a pop act, if they've been in a boy band or a girl band or something like that, and they, and they go solo, they have this huge fear of being pop, can't be pop, can't be pop. Um, but it does, you know, it just means popular, and means a lot of people like it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that's that's what it's a, a pop song is. It, it, there's, there's no there's no boundaries to it. There's no rules. It's just something that everybody likes, or a lot of people like. Yeah, and it's weird the people that are in the pop industry to have a problem with it since they presumably want people to hear the songs and like them. Right. I, since I work a lot with in, in the urban market, I was like, we don't want to do pop music. I was like, don't be afraid of pop music. Hmm. If you want to be popular, you got to do pop music. Yeah, I mean, you work with Kelly Rollins, you work with um, Sugar Babes, also Jessica Malboy and um, Guy Sebastian. These guys are all kind of fighting for number one, aren't they? Right. Guy is very afraid of pop music. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Gary? What do you think? Um, I try not to think about it too much. Now, pop, yeah, pop music is, a, is, a, is something that's popular. But you can't really think about that when you're when you're writing. That's like the death, I think. If you think about, it. but we're not writing now, so we can't think about. It. But um, I don't know. What is pop music? Yeah, pop, popular. So much. For me, it kind of encapsulates most music, really, to a degree. Yeah, I mean, these days, there's so many genres. If you were trying to write a pop song, what genre would you go for? Well, it depends who you Yeah. Um, I mean, most of the stuff I do is with, with the artists in the room, and, uh, you know, can't, can't write a hip hop song with country artists. You just got to sort of go with. Uh, who I was there and what, what their styles are and what they like. I mean, if you, if you start from fresh with no artist in the room, then you just know what you like. Hmm. Um, but there's, again, there's certainly no boundaries to what's more pop than something else. You know, during Nashville, where country songs are really pop songs. Hmm. Um, I just heard if you're in England, then you're not. I just heard Snoop Dogg singing on Willie Nelson's new song. Oh, and I thought that was ridiculous. Well, he's actually singing. He's not, he's not graphic. Yeah. Well, let's ask the big question, which I guess is why all you guys are here, because you've written so many international artists, all of you. How do you write a pop song? Big question. Yes. Would you like to say? Um, well, I think it's different. Every session is different. You know, how you go about it. About it. Um, yeah, this, you know, if you want to do the obvious pop song, you got to focus on the chorus because that's the most important thing. So when you nail the chorus, everything else just follows. So you start the chorus. Yeah. That's it. That's, it. that's, that's a really good advice. Yeah. That's a pretty good advice to start doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me. I sort of it just say, it's just, for me, it's like I start with a central idea. I need to have an idea, a roadmap for where I'm going, a concept. So I feel like if I have a concept that interests me and excites me, um, that's where I would start with writing, writing a pop song. An idea, I think, that could be. That's a cool idea. That's a new way of saying something. That's a twist on something. I can write a song about this that people might like. So you start with a story? Uh, yes. What's, what's the idea behind the story? Not a story necessarily. I mean, like, 
an idea, but it's different. I find stories actually hard to write. But like, with an idea, it, you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily a story. Story songs are something like I aspire, I aspire to write. And then you have like kind of conceptual songs, which are more just like an idea and lots of kind of words around it related to that idea. But yeah. it's not a story, yeah, necessarily. But, um, yeah, so for me, an idea I think is a great place to start. A simple a title or an idea. I have like pages, I'm sure we all do, of just lines, ideas, concepts, seeds, something you'll see in the street, a sentence, something you'll overhear someone say on the street, and that could be like the start of a song. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think, that's, it's, I think we probably work in a similar way then, because, you, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's trying to find something that uh, is just incredibly simple, which says everything you want to say. And, and if you can find that sort of one line or that sort of concept, that idea, which is, just says everything in a, in a sh short amount of words. Like somebody that I used to know. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, um, that's an idea. <laughs> um, and then, because and then, it kind of needs to be memorable, you know, I sort of really sort of keep sort of telling myself that was every time I write a song, it's got to be memorable, it's got to be simple, you know, it just can't be too complicated. The chorus has, you know, got to be hooky, it doesn't have to be, you know, epic or anything like that, you know, depending on what you're doing. It just needs to be a memorable idea which, whatever the singer is talking about, the, the listener is taken in by it, it's believable, and um, you know, could forget about everything else for a while. So, so connection is a big thing for you then? Because I hear something like um, Umbrella, Brianna. Mm. Massive worldwide hit. It doesn't make me want to buy an umbrella. I don't, I don't even know what it's about. Yeah. Well, it's not about buying an umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> well, I heard, I heard umbra <laughs> umbrella sales went up actually when that was. Was it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I just heard Nelly Furtado's this new song called Big Hoops, which, uh, the bigger the better, which I thought was some euphemism, but it's about earrings. Yeah. Right. Big Hoops? Yeah, Big Hoops. That's an idea. Why didn't I think of that one? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a basketball song, at least. But you see, the umbrella's an interesting one, because the sort of, the good thing about that is it's just really hooky. On the face of it, the track's great, she sings it great, you know, it's a good chorus, and it's fine, and you can let it go of your head and enjoy it as a tune. But actually, lyrically, it's... It's really nice. Mm. Yeah, it's well, really umbrella. Cool. Yeah. That's, That's a great, great idea. idea. Yeah. Umbrella. Well, that, that could have started just with the title. Yeah. Like, this is a this hand is hand step. Step. How, do, how do we get there? Like, um, I mean, I love that song. I like the ugliness of the word as well. Yeah. It's not, it's, young, it's not in loads of songs. You know? no. It's kind of it's a weird thing to sing. And that's what makes it really memorable. And so, so abrasive can be good in some ways. Like, I think so, yeah. I mean, I, I actually think it's quite important. Mm. Uh, it grabs you. It grabs you. Yeah. yeah. Um, you don't want to be sort of nice and, you know, you want to, people want to hear what you're talking about. Mm. And if you make, if you make the lyric as unusual as you can, um, saying something simple, uh, that usually pricks people's ears up. A lyric is a, a, is a thing which a lot of people don't really listen to at first, it takes them a while. So if you've got something that's, you know, a bit ugly, a bit abrasive, you know, it sort of pricks people's ears up, I think. Every, everyone's trying to get people's attention, you know, now more, more than ever, and more and more so as, as time goes on, you know, the, the, uh, the airwaves are a chock a block with people buying for your attention. And you see in pop music, more and more kind of out-of-the-box titles, concepts, songs like, you know, Fuck You, and these kind of, this is, I kiss the girl, like concepts and ideas to try and, you know, get your attention, or what's a very small space, you know? So people more and more you see coming up with ideas that are trying to do that. You know, new ideas, things, twists, and paint. I mean, I don't know. No, I do know. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, You're an expert. You hear people that. are doing yeah. more and more. You know, yeah. it's, it's, concepts and get get more and more convoluted, yeah. um, challenging, jarring. You know, and it's the same in films. You know, to get people's attention, there's films like Human Centipede and these films where you know the hook is like the uh, the central idea. You know, it's more and more outlandish, more and more. Film. I don't know. Is it a good film? No. no. <laughs> no. I just never actually seen that film. The sequel. <laughs> the sequel. <laughs> really? Yeah. Does anyone know this film, Human Centipede? It's the central idea is about a doctor. I won't tell you. Okay, <laughs> horrible. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> uh, I mean, Centipede, what is this? We tried to write the song, but we couldn't. What rhymes with Centipede? Yeah. 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 Um, 
But it's the same in, in, in movies and it's the same in music because I feel that yeah, people are trying to get people's attention more and more. Not, not, not necessarily saying you have to... In a short space of time. In a short space well. of time, yeah. With like, what's the, what's the hook of, of the idea? Do you think that the death of albums that pop has become more important? Because it's, it's become more about just choruses now, hasn't it? it it's like fast food. You have to go with a hook right away, you know, because people have so short attention span nowadays. You're the Ronald McDonald of the uh, I know, oh. yeah. <laughs> well, but in saying that, I saw Prince the other night, and, and Prince did a whole section of his show where he just played choruses. He just had this whole rave about, you know, old school, tell young school how many hits Prince has got, this is what he's yelling out, and then he went through like 20 minutes of choruses, and you're going, that scene contrived, and you're going, he's got where the world's at, and he's, oh, luckily he's got the catalog to pull it off. But it, it seemed odd, and I went, wow, he's realised where people are at, and he's just feeding them what they want. Even in, you know, he did other jams that went for 10 minutes, he did a 15 minute version of Purple Rain, but he could just blast. I think also was, with the argument about albums, and you know, not many people are making albums anymore. Hmm. You know, a lot of people are, are, I mean, you know, there is a part of that where, you know, people do want sort of singles and singles and singles, and so, you know, maybe people aren't given the license to write albums and this sort of class of anymore, but, you know, somebody like Adele makes an album and everybody buys it. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure people aren't buying albums, I just, I think maybe sometimes there's not an album to buy. Yeah. It's, well, you know, with her again, it's a connection thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the thing, and, and you've got to have your heart broken. God knows what's going to happen when she does the next album. She'll just need to break up with everything. Is it, is it happy? Is it easy to write songs when you're happy? Because it seems that so much music that seems to make it, like, Goy gave me a classic example, here's a song from all around the world about misery. Adele, another situation. Can you write songs when you're happy? Because you write pop songs, surely you've got to be happy. Well, it's yeah, tough, actually. Actually. yeah, I mean, if you, if you make the song super happy, so easy that it's on the edge of being cheesy, I guess. Yeah, but you got to be in a good mood to write good songs. Yeah. I like writing songs that sound happy, but when you investigate like the lyric, it's actually really sad. And that, which is a great song, I think. Sad, sad, sad lyrics, happy music, and vice yeah, versa. Yeah, it's like a trick. Yeah. yeah. It sounds people like, oh, that's a really happy song. No, that's not a happy song. Have yeah. <laughs> you listened to the words? Um, I find it hard to... I, I'm really happy, so that's why I'm like, if I'm, I write a lot. I find it hard to write. Happy. Can I just say that? I'm very yeah, yeah. happy. That's a big mission. Can I go back home? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't write when I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, I can write when I'm happy. You do? I mean, I don't write necessarily like happy songs. Right. But, um, uh, you know, I, again, I like sort of disguising a happy song and a sad song. You know, there's some great songs like that as well. Yeah, there's like Wonderful World, James Morrison is the first one that sort of springs to mind, which is really. Always sounds like it. I thought it was a positive song for ages until I listened to it. Right, great. Right. You know, I know it's a wonderful world, but I don't feel it right now. It's great, what a great line. Mm. Um, it's amazing how many wedding songs get played that are actually about heartache. Yeah. Because they sound like they're romantic songs. Yeah, actually. absolutely. Wings. Wings. Yeah, good reference. <laughs> <on that. laughs> right, Let's talk about collaborating. There's Collaborating is so different. If you write, you guys write songs. So if you write a song and you go, "Shit, this would be great for Rihanna," Rihanna you can just or whoever you pass around. But to actually get in a room with someone and essentially become them, because you write behind the scenes, you've got to become them. Is that really hard to do? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, well, I, I find it a lot easier when the artist is in the room. Um, I think coming from you know, I tried to be an artist for years and failed miserably. But there's a, so there is a sort of small part of me that still loves the process of being an artist and um, getting into somebody's mind and sort of going along on the journey. It's the same reason I like working with people um, early on before they've been signed and sort of going through that whole process with them because, you know, it's nice to sort of be on a journey with somebody. And, uh, and then if you're working with somebody who's more established, it's nice to have them in a the room, even if they're not necessarily doing much or contributing much, just to hear them sing it and just to see if it works and for them to say yes and no. I mean, one of the, the 
the main difficulties writing and then pitching is, um, you know, it just, it just m it might be a fantastic song, it just might not sound great with the artist singing it. Mm. And you don't know that until they've recorded it. And, you know, it's, it's just it's I, I a mystery. Yeah, it's, it's a mystery. mystery. I find it much easier when they're in the room. And, and do you quiz them much about, do you say, yeah, what sound are you like? Where you're at? What, what are you trying to project? And, yeah, that's how I start. It's an interview situation, situation before you start? Yeah, if, I, yeah. if I'm working with an artist, you know, they'll come to the studio at uh, 10, 11 o'clock, and then it'll be, tea, you know, coffee and, and cake, maybe for like a few hours, mm -hmm. and just talking. But like, like I mean, they don't realise they're being interviewed, but they really are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, what's going on? What's been happening? Right. Get, a, get the story, get the thread of where this, what's, where this person's coming from. You can quickly figure out what you're going to be writing about that, that day. You know, Very on. early on in the writing songs, a, a writer friend of mine said the best thing you can do in a co-write for the first couple of hours is absolutely nothing. And I think that's really true. I think, as Gary said, it's, it's just trying to figure out who you're with. Yeah. I, I met Noel Rogers last year. I interviewed him in New York and he was talking about working with Diana Ross and she was trying to get away from the Motown thing. She said, I really want to change myself and reinvent myself and the whole thing. And he spent the whole day hearing his story, and then he went out to a transvestite bar that night. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he was standing there having a wee at the toilet, and he realised that there were four Diana Ross impersonators <laughs> having a piss of urinal next to him. And he went home and wrote, I'm out. coming out. Mm -hmm. um, well, <laughs> and she went, oh, this is exactly where I want to be. <laughs> but based on the information. But that, that's why I was saying before, Niall is very much like right. that. And if you follow, he's got a great blog. He's got someone great to kind of read about and follow. He just wrote a great book as, as well. Yeah, incredible book. Life, called The Freak. But he, um, he, 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 all of his big hits have been from those moments, just from being out. Like he had that, like, I'm coming out, you know, in the toilet of the transvestite bar and freak out, you know. Went, well, he got, yeah, he got told to fuck off yeah, from yeah. 54 and wrote a song called Fuck Off. Yeah, yeah. Triple, <laughs> triple platinum in America as freak out, yeah. So it's like when you're out and about, those are often the times when, you know, you get those sparks or ideas. And I think people that take themselves seriously when they have those sparks or ideas, like, not, you know, any of us could be in the toilet of the transvestite bar and, uh, <laughs> and have the idea coming out, you know, but only like a pro that takes himself seriously can they go home and write the song, you know. Ideas are free and they're like all, everywhere, you know, but it's like, do you take them seriously? Sometimes if I'm going to bed and falling asleep and I have an idea and I don't get up and write it down, I, I say to myself, hey, you know, are you, are you taking this idea, so, you know, you've got to take your ideas seriously, you know, mm. that's, your, that's the currency, like we're in, we're in, I'm in the ideas business. You know? Yeah. Fredro, do you, do you try and connect with the artist first, or...? Well, usually for me it's that uh, I had a meeting with the, like the A&R and the label and the management, so they kind of, they set it up for me, and then, you know, I meet the artist and just pick his or her brain a little bit and then go from there. Hmm. And, and I prefer to have the artist there, because, you know, the artist will get the placement is so much bigger than she, I mean, the artist is involved in the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just it's a song that the label sent to the artist, you know, this yeah. connection there. And yeah. find something that they can believe in as well. Really yeah, important. yeah. You know, they've got to sell it, and I mean, I think... It's, it's not you that's sort of singing every night for the rest of your life. No, absolutely, and, and for me, that is the absolute most important thing in, in songwriting, is believability and, and conviction in something that's singing it. If, if somebody doesn't believe it, then it could be the best song in the world. It just sounds awful. Mm. Um, yeah, good pop music is, is believable. Is yeah, believable. Absolutely. And it can be redone by anyone. I mean, I, I heard it once said the resonance to it, it's a man's world, a completely fucked up version, but it meant more than James Brown's version. Yeah. <laughs> because you can't break it if the meaning is solid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, as, uh, you know when you sing a song, which, which you can relate to, um, you know, there's, there's just more in it. There's, there's more in the gaps. Um, and it really comes across, always comes across, and people can see through fake so yeah. easily. They might even not even know that they're doing it, but you can see through a fake so quick. Well, and that's the reason people like Adele succeed. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can hear the heartache in every syllable. That's the thing, the song is like just the start of it. It's almost like 50% of it, and then, you, then there's the performance, you know? So you have, a lot, in pop music as well, you have a lot of great producers and great performers that are able to do really good work with songs. Songs aren't actually that good. You know, the, 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 just the performance is great and the production is great. Maybe the song isn't that great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you have people that are great songwriters but can't seem to get the performances right, their songs or the production's right. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of like, different, different elements to it. Uh, 
Tell me about some of your successes then. People, so songs that you've written where all that's come together. Fred, do you want to start? With a song that you have written that you saw through. How, how do you mean? It's well, just the one that you, you're really happy with that you go, you know what, I wrote this with somebody and, you know, whether it's chart success or whatever, you just went this, you know, talk about one that came together. Um, well, I remember one of the earliest hits that I had, that was with uh, Christina Milian. You know, and we just, you know, we, we started everything just from scratch and we, we had her in mind and we, we know she was coming to the studio like the next week and, and you know, every piece is all in the right place and boom, and it was that uh, the second most played song that year in all Europe. And so. Did you have the idea ready before she, she came? Yeah, most of it. Because, because she knew she was coming? Yeah. You know, and we were all brainstorming, we were like, Five people, you know, and the result was wow. Yeah. Gary, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, only one, one, one. <laughs> um, for me, I had a, uh, an interesting experience recently with a, a, a dance song um, called "Cinema," which I wrote to a uh, to a, a, a dance. Uh, a, a, track. It's, there's a lot of different ways people are starting now writing. And I often get like sent just like a piece of music to kind of write. This is a Benny Benetti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A piece of, like a beat. Yeah. Uh, to write a, a song to and come up with a, an idea just to like a, a beat. Um, which is new for me. You know, I came from starting writing songs from the piano or the guitar from the scratch. And now there's a big kind of part of this industry of people, you know, like collaborating and sending beats around or tracks or, um, and uh, working like that. It was a new way of working for me. And uh, it was interesting, you know, I tried it and then um, and we had a, a, a big hit with the song. And what was interesting... It was number one on Billboard US charts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a big hit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then what was really interesting is then this, someone remixed it in a different style. Skrillex. Skrillex. Yeah. And then it became a big hit again, you know, in a whole other genre, and won a, like, won a Grammy for this remix. So what was really interesting for me was, from a songwriter's point of view, that's like a lesson in how important kind of the, the, a production is of a song and how something's put together. Because, you know, if you don't find, there's so many elements to it, if you don't find the right kind of voice or frame for your picture, you know, some people might never like see your, your picture, you know? So it's, it's interesting how this kind of other producer reimagined this, this song and it was like re rediscovered it again. So it opened my eyes uh, a bit as well. Like, the possibilities. I've got the possibilities, yeah. Kanye West said about that track, about that mix, he said it's one of the greatest works of art ever. Ever made? Yeah. Ever made. Sorry, excuse me for getting this. <laughs> <laughs> Not that you've seen it. Not that you've got it. I was, about to, your I was about to go on stage on New Year's Eve and uh, at a, at a, it's funny, at a, a show in Anaheim that's called White, Wonder, White Wonderland where everyone, uh, could, so everyone was dressed in white. There were like 5,000 people dressed in white and I didn't have anything white to wear and I felt I was letting the team down. So I was about to go on stage in my robe, my bathrobe from the hotel room. <laughs> And then I saw this uh, tweet, Kanye West, you know, that's a great, yeah. and he, I'm a huge, such a big fan. Yeah. Um, so that was why, that was my going into 2012, that was a fun thing to read. But yeah, but he said that about this remix, so that, that's like an, an, an interesting thing, that don't, don't give up on an idea, and you know, maybe you might have a, a great song that's with, mm -hmm. the wrong with the wrong production. Yeah. So from, so from the scene of the idea to that, Great quote. What time period was that? Um, you know, quite a while. Mm. Well, uh, quite, yeah, I mean, uh, a year, uh, year and a half maybe. Mm. But um, yeah. Well, yeah, it, you know, because things like tempo can change a song. Just one simple thing can mm. make it between a hit and not a hit, can't they? But, a bit like big mm. time. Yeah. There's yeah. so many elements that make something hit and not yeah. hit. Yeah. Have you got any stories, Adam? Well, I mean, you know, there's sort of a few, few things that, um, that come to mind. I mean, there's 
success is you know sort of measured in different ways as well. I mean, um, I did something over over here with a guy called West Car Idol, and um, the biggest song you know we wrote we wrote sort of eight songs for the album, and uh, the biggest one that came off the album was just a, a jam that, that we did a song called Feels Like Work. Um, it wasn't a serious song. We didn't mean it in a serious way at all. We just sort of jammed it, recorded it, and then started the session. You know, it was sort of it was done very very quickly. And um, you know, most of that first jam thing was what I did on on the record, and it did very well. And yet, we spent days on other tunes that were just album tracks or even some that didn't get on the album. And then and then there's other songs that have a more emotional connection. Um, you know, it's just a. One of my proudest songs uh, was just on, a, on an album, you know, it was never released as a single. Um, it was a very simple production, just uh, acoustic guitars um, with, I'm not sure if he came over here, but a guy called Newton Faulkner in, mm. in the, the UK. Um, I feel like Ranger. Uh, yeah, true. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, it's one of my proudest songs, but, you know, it's not sort of measured in success the, the right way. Mm. Um, and we wrote that, you know, sort of the London Eye was we were sort of looking at the London Eye, um, which for those who don't know is a huge Ferris wheel in London and it's always turned. Um, but it never looks like it's moving. And uh, we just kind of like the concept of life being like the London Eye and that, you know, even when it feels stuck and stood still, um, you've got to remember that it's, that it's always moving. The song is called Uncomfortably Slow. But, um, you know, no matter how success is, or you know, your sort of proudest moment, or how it all comes together. You know, I've done a lot of stuff since then, but that's definitely the one I'm sort of proud of and consider my biggest hit, even though mm. it never was. Yeah, I and mean, it's interesting, you've just said a really important thing about songwriting, I think both, all of you, is that is knowing when a song is finished, is it going to take a year and a half? Is it going to be done in the first jam? Mm. You know? How, how do you, you recognise that? Thing? I'm usually tired. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, no, that's so true. It's like I hear, because I interview a lot of bands with my job of working on TV, and so many times I hear about these big hits that were written in two minutes. People go, oh, I just wrote down, it just came to me. And you go, how could that be so? But it's knowing, the art, a big part of the art is knowing when it's done. Yeah. I think, maybe, I think it was Brian Eno maybe that said about albums that you don't finish them, you know, you abandon them. And I think like, song, it's similar with, with songs. You know, you, you could like nuance something until and kill it, you know? Oh, I think we've, we've all done that, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, with records or something, like you could just work on something and, uh, and then just like smother it. And, hmm. In fact, it's a, good, a good example of that, and it wasn't necessarily in the songwriting process, but um, just recently before I came away and having the stress of having to finish this production before I came to Australia, you know, and it, uh, it's a guy, um, I don't think you have over here called Ollie Mers, who's uh, huge, an ex about to be huge, she's going to be huge. Yeah. Um, and um, we've, I've written on the first two albums with him and a couple of singles. And now he's going to America and it seems to be sort of picking up with that. So the, the kind of pressure was more than we've ever had before. You know, it, was, it really needs to be better than what he's done before and more international. And just the sort of the pressure of all that and trying to get it right and it's not quite finished, it's not good enough and it's not, you know, all this pressure that I've sort of put on myself to do this production, I hand it in and they hate it and then they just hate it and, um, and I thought well I've got to get something finished before I come away and literally in an afternoon in a kind of, well fuck it, they're going to have to like it because I've got to go away, um, handed it in and they loved it, you know, it's just that sort of not overthinking, not overthinking it, it and yeah. not thinking, is it finished? Does it need to be better? Does it, you know, maybe it needs an extra section of, you know, trusting your gut and just thinking, yeah, it's, it sounds great. I don't know if it's right or not, but mm. it feels, feels good. It, you, I, I, I feel it, if you sit and twist and turn too much, you're still going to go back to the first original yeah. version anyway. Because mm. that was, you know, you've got to feel... You can really yeah. zap the life out, I think. Mean, yeah, I, I, and I can imagine when you get to the level you guys are at, it must be, one thing someone told me on, early on is never chase now, because when it's released it'll be yesterday. But with you guys trying to say at the top cutting edge, is it really hard not to try and chase now? Like the, I mean, record companies must come and say, look, Adele's big, write us an Adele song, or whatever. How do you stay out of that murky pool? I mean, the, the labels always want, you know, they, they mention all the, the top three hits this week, and they want it to sound like that. 
Well, you know the record's not going to be out in at least six months, a year, so if you, if you make it sound just like that, then everybody's going to think, you know, his copy tag is dated, too, mm. so you have to... By the time it comes out. Yeah. yeah. I think things are born by limitation as well, you know, um, sometimes you do try to hear a really good song and think, I really want to write a song like that, and by initially having that thought but not being um, married to the idea of it's got something exactly like that, you can come up with other stuff and, you know, ideas come from ideas. So, you know, a bit of chasing is not, not such a bad thing. OK, this is, might be something you guys want to know, but if one of these guys had written a song, how would they approach an artist? If, if they've written a song, they go, right, I, I want to give this to well, Rihanna. Yeah. Right. How, would they, how would they start? How would they approach it? Just call her up. Oh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, rest is short of the crack, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I guess you got to try to reach out to the management. I guess that's the easiest way to do it. Hmm. You know, but it's Is that the first way? Uh, rather than a publisher or, you know? Well, I, mean, I, don't, I mean, the publisher doesn't really <laughs> they don't have anything to say about those yeah. projects on that level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna go from I'm going to be a songwriter, so I'm going to get a song cut with Rihanna, you know, you're, no. you're not going to know. I think no, that's, happened. that's not impossible, though. It's not impossible, but, you know, on a, to talk on a sort of broader level, you know, part of being a songwriter is taking up opportunities and being in as many rooms as you possibly can, and, you know, everything's important. You know, you work with people who are unsigned, and them, them songs are just as important as working with people who are signed, because different people hear it, and, you know, once a song is born, there's no getting rid of it. You know, it can, it can be around and different record companies. I mean, you know, when I first decided to concentrate on being a songwriter, I worked with all unsigned acts. And, uh, I mean, I don't think any of them got signed, but a lot of them tried to get deals and so played songs to the same people. And it doesn't take long for a record company to ask who wrote that song and your name keeps coming up from different people. Then that gets you into a certain level, and then the next bunch of songs gets into another level, and, and, and all the rest of it. And then doors like Rihanna and the sort of top spectrum of things start, start getting more open. Um, but you know, th there is a lot of luck involved, and sure, exactly, you can be lucky and think, I'm going to start writing a song, and it gets cut by you know, somebody or whatever. Um, but you know, a lot of hard work is needed to be a songwriter. It's not just about um, jamming and thinking, you know. There's a lot of work involved. Yeah, I, I met um, Diane Warren last year, who, Diane Warren, if you don't know, she's the second most successful female entertainer of all time, and she's never put out a record. She writes for everyone else, and to give you an indication, she one week in the Billboard charts had 17 songs in the top 30. Which, <laughs> and, and now, when she wants to um, write for Beyonce, she just rings Jay-Z. <laughs> they take her call. <laughs> But in saying that, the point you made is that she goes to work six days a week. She doesn't need to work. She goes in six days a week and gets up, writes songs. The songs don't write themselves, and she just does it. And I asked her a songwriting advice, and she said, do it every day. Yeah. Because, you know, you might write one good song in 50, but you need to write those other 49 <laughs> yeah. to get there. And you don't know which one that's going to yeah. be either. You, know, you don't know which the great one's going to be. Yeah. OK, well, um, are there any songs left? How many ideas left? Of course it is, you know. There's new ideas being born every day. You know, or you just take pieces and combine the you haven't seen before. And mm -hmm. endless com combination. Yeah. 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 Is it overwhelming though? Because there's so much music now. More than ever before. It's so cheap to make. The, as you said, the airwaves are filled. Yeah, I mean, music's always been free to make. I mean, you know, yeah. ideas are free and you just need a, a guitar or something or you can sing or that or that or anything. So, but yeah, it's, it's easy to put music out now more than ever. So uh, it's harder to, to get people's attention now. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what's harder. You know, creating the process has been the same, I think, from the beginning of when people started to make music. But I think it's harder, to, if you want to make pop music, music to become popular, it's harder to do that. I think, because there's more of it available to more, you know, to more people. Um, 
But yeah, I definitely think there's, like, there's ideas or in, you know, it's eternal or anything. Like well, Big Hoops, which we found. Big Hoops. What, what, do you, what do you do with, how do you kickstart inspiration? If you're at a point where, um, yeah, you're uninspired, because you guys are, you know, your job every day is to write songs. What do you do, you know? Is it a lot of coke? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> shit, shit, drug, you're right on, everyone knows. Um, you know, is it red wine? Is it a walk? You just get out of your environment. What do you do? Um, I walk around in New York and get inspired. Yeah. And, and um, the, the, I go from, from the subway to my studio, pass by Korean Street, and that's just craziness going on. So, and like every morning I see something weird, and I was like, yeah, that, that's, I'll go with that. Or, or just the sound. You know, like I, I just made a. I recorded a new artist in Motown called B. Smith, and the whole track is made of a, a police siren. So that's how I saw it. It was played like, whip, whip, whip. Yeah. And that created the whole thing. Wow. Yeah, the, the starting point can, can vary, I think. I think it's cool to be open to different ways of starting, whether you're in you know, the bathroom of a transvestite bar and you have an idea, or you hear like a police siren and have an idea. I think uh, it can come from different, different places. I just think like some, you've got to be like a receiver, you know, like you've got to be open to these ideas coming at you from different places. And I think some people, and it's the same in life really, you know, some people see opportunities and, and, and take them, you know, and some people, do, some people don't. You know, you've got to have the antenna up there, which will be the antenna. antenna. Yeah, you've got to have the radar and you can think. And that's easier the more you do it. You know, is it like a muscle? People talk about like a muscle. Like the that's more you do it, if you get out of practice, you've got to. Whenever I come back from being on holiday, I say, it's the first session which feels like I've never written a song before in my life. It just feels so weird. Um, so then the more you do it, the more, yeah, definitely the sort of easier it comes. I mean, the initial inspiration isn't necessarily um, tough. What I find is. There's always that bit in a, in a session where you're stuck at some point, and that's when you sort of really need to sort of kick start the inspiration, like you're saying. And usually it's just doing something different, just changing the subject, just talk about something else for a while, stand up if you're sitting down, sit down, just sort of work on another track, or. Yeah. Mm. Well, maybe not necessarily work on another track, but you know, switching guitar to piano, or go for, you know, just do something different. Shift the energy, yeah. yeah. I yeah. like that, I, I saw this sort of maybe like a Pixar, the animation company, yeah. they all work standing up. Which I think, wow. yeah, yeah, it's like you're more alert, you know, and when you're doing animation, it's such, such detailed work, you know, it's very easy to kind of. Jesus, that must be so hard. Well, <laughs> so it's like about energy, you know, like having yeah. a spark, not, not like losing yeah. you know, a, a moment. So, yeah. And not letting the pressure of that get to you either. I mean, you just don't worry about it. If, you know, if you suck, it's, it's going to come. I mean, you've got a lot of confidence in your own ability, and, and you know, if, if you're going to. If you can write a song, you can write a song. It's going to come. Hmm. So just don't have to worry about it. The more pressure you put on yourself, it just only gets harder from that point. Okay. It's good to do other stuff other than the, yeah. the music. Yeah. Like, I've spent too much time like, in, in the studio. That some, you can spend so much time trying to do it that you have, have nothing to, to write about. Yeah. Other than, like, I'm and this is, a, this is like, for a lot of artists, it's like the difficult second album situation. I'm in the studio again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing a song again. You know, you gotta be, you gotta be out there and hear a siren and yeah, live. Just, just backtracking for a second about collaborating with people. There's a famous story about Elvis Presley that if you, if some Elvis recorded one of your songs, he would get fifty percent of the song, even though he never wrote a note. <laughs> Some it would be incredible if Elvis recorded one of my songs. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it'd be wonderful. But you know, that's the thing, 50% of an Elvis song is, is, is you know, worth 100% of a lot of songs. But oh, my question is, is it hard to negotiate with these big artists when they come in the room and don't really do any work? Don't make any names, but is that a hard situation where you go, you're screwing me on this? No. No, I, I think usually it's pretty easy to, to speed it up, you know. It's, it's when they come afterwards, or the management comes afterwards, and like ask you for a big chunk. Yeah, you know. But it's you know this is a discussion, and you have to see what's you know what's in it for me. <laughs> is, it, is it worth it? So when do you negotiate that? Do you have a manager that does that? I'm just this is for people here. If you're collaborating with somebody, when would you 
bring that up. Obviously not first before you start. I mean, I, I, some people do that. Yeah, it's really it's a point. bad way to start. Yeah, no. Always first. <laughs> I mean, music yeah. 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 yeah, so clearly that's how you've written or what. It avoids those situations. That's exactly why you don't. You basically go, you know, you go to ground rules, walk in the so you don't get those situations where you come and try and renegotiate. These are music publishers, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I, just, uh, I just always assume it's an equal split to everyone's in their own sort of some set of lives. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, really it's different all over the world, but I know, like in Nashville, that's a big thing. People break it pretty easily. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't even matter if somebody's not really contributing that much. Um, you know, saying yes and no in a session and not coming up with ideas completely changes the whole song. Um, you know, if you're in a collaborative, you know, if you've agreed that, you know, me and Gary are going to be in a session with an artist, we all know that there's going to be three people in a session, makes a three-way split. There's nothing more to talk about. I mean, when it comes to the other thing that you were saying, if you've if we've written a song together and a bigger artist uh, wants to cut it and um, wants a percentage, and that's sort of, I suppose you've got to decide how much of a percentage is going to sort of pay off, in it? I mean, you know, it wouldn't, I, I wouldn't mind, you know, it's... it's so it still it's, happens, clearly. Yeah, absolutely, it still happens, yeah. Yeah. So we they put their name on it, but it's kind of nice to have their name yeah, I mean, it, usually, it, usually, it usually depends what what reason they want the percentage. Do so they want it for the money or do they want it for the credit? Um, and, you know, I've, I've put that to a couple of artists. Where, you know, you can either have the credit and none of the publishing, or I'll give you the publishing but no credit. Wow. Um, How does that wash? Yeah, all right. Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, you know, mostly, you know, some sort of independent um, artist. I mean, I, you know, a, a, a girl I, I, I've worked a bit with and, you know, um, still putting out albums that don't really sell that much, but she just loves doing it. Um, Melanie C from the Spice Girls. Um, worked with her on a lot of different albums and, um, you know, selling records to her doesn't make as much money as, as it used to and she doesn't sell as many albums. And, you know, she's alright in Germany and things like that, but she needs, she needs publishing. Um, and the few songs that she's cut of mine, I've just written them up by myself um, and given her publishing and it wasn't her, that's that was the management yeah. but it's because they need as much revenue as possible but she hasn't taken the credit uh, she's just taken the percentage It's a bold request, it's always a bold request Yeah, I mean I, I find people sort of take it pretty well to be honest Okay, um, I don't know how long we've taken but I, I want to open up to some questions I'm sure you guys want to ask There you go I want to ask this Yes. When you finish a song that's maybe not for an artist, but where you're actually going to, with the artist, where you're actually going to mix the song, what sort of quality is that demo going to do? It needs to sound like a CD. Yeah. You don't want to leave it up to people's imagination. Because, you know, you might know what you mean, but it's got to be as good as you can do it. It's just going to be like they, you know, they replace the demo vocals with the artist vocals, and yeah. then take it to master, and that's done. someone that sounds like the per you know girl that sounds like the person who you want to sing the song you you often try and convince yourself that they're going to get it if I just sort of do my mail off on it and just say it's female, they'll, they'll get it they'll definitely get it because it sounds great but people don't I mean they just don't you just need to make it as obvious as possible and I think sometimes when you're songwriting you assume that everybody has that sort of um, songwriting mind because that's how you think, so why does everybody else think like that? But um, it's just not the way it is. What would you do with the demo? So you can basically do exactly as you can have a single and all that and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce Springsteen put out an album last year called The Promise, and on there he's got a song 
from 1979 that he wrote for Elvis, which is fire, which is the point of is it, you know, fire. But he actually is singing it with the Elvis twang. It's the demo. He's got I'm driving in my car. He's actually singing it. It's so weird. You can actually, from the album that came out, it's, but he actually was going, I'm going to, and it, it apparently died like the week he, he got there, the, the track. But it's, it's weird to hear him impersonating to get the gig. Yeah. Now, I think you had a question there. Sorry. This seems like a great community yeah. right, right here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, one thing that every songwriter has in common is evolving in a different way. And uh, I don't think there is a, a, a one route. You know, I, I again, tried to be an artist for a lot of years and so I made a lot of contacts who sort of doing that. Um, so <laughs> I was very lucky in being able to uh, make contacts that then sort of came back into use when I started to be a songwriter. Um, and because of that, I wouldn't really know how to do it any other way. But I can see how it's, it's a great question. I don't know really I mean, networking, everything comes down to networking. Yeah. You know, if, it, if it's online or going out to shows or... Shows know, are always a good place to meet, meet people, aren't they? You know, and there's a lot of like, sites where you can upload your songs and get it, you know, reviewed and, and like, people in the business will listen to it and email you back. I think your point too about just work with unknowns because once the song's born, it's yeah. it's there. So if you, someone if, if someone big hears this unknown person doing a song and it's a great song, then that will yeah. that will gravitate. Yep. Yeah, in terms of like pitching to labels, um, with a full production demo and a written song, what's your opinion on like perhaps intentionally leaving out like the bridge or some portion of the song so that both the label and the People are doing that now. I get a lot of traction people with gaps yeah, to try and, uh, yeah, involve. I think it's a clever idea. Yeah. It's, common, it's quite common sense, isn't it? Yeah. I, I leave the bridge open in many cases for, for the artists to go, go in and write and get, you know, a little percentage. I mean, I usually find, find fault in it anyway, so um, I usually get that bit of say in some way. Um, so maybe, so maybe I should start doing that. Maybe it's a good idea. Leaving gaps. Leaving gaps. <laughs> it's an obvious thing to pick up on and say something I really like. <laughs> <laughs> Totally track. copy it. Totally copy it and take yeah. all the credit. I mean, it just it happens, unfortunately. And uh, <clears throat> as soon as I figure out a way that that doesn't happen, I'll be a happier <laughs> man. <laughs> specifically talking about how pitching songs for pop yeah. artists and radio, you know, which yeah. is a certain school, you know, and then there's a lot of other, other things going, you know, but yeah. Someone wants to hear the potential yeah, I think if you want to convey, like, what something can be and you, you can hear where it can go or see where it can go, then you, you should do everything you can to take it there, you know, to communicate the potential that you, that you feel of hearing the idea. And, and sometimes if you don't... A lot of people are like, well, I'm not a producer, you know, I'm a songwriter. So, so I mean, to so find, a, find, a you know, find a producer that maybe can help realise the ideas. And, and unfortunately, the sad fact is that you do need to be able to produce to a, to a certain level if you want to be a successful songwriter. I mean, it's, I, I think it's, it's terrible that that's become one of, one of the same, because there is a huge distinction between having a good song and a good production, but it's getting more and more m matched in. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to be a, pr a good producer to be a good songwriter. Songwr absolutely, oh, totally, totally agree. But unfortunately, um, when you and you're absolutely right, and sort of talking more about sort of pop stuff and, and things like that, you know, people just don't get it if it's not produced. Yeah. Good point. Uh, yep. Yeah. Sorry. 
Yeah, you go. Uh, can you speak to the, the, the growing trend like um, of pricing houses basically making back and bringing the singer to jam over the top and we don't, you know, the bowels of the day that kind of really the track. Do any of you work like that? And there's obviously a confusion with the singer, not the artist that's involved, so it'll be that. Um, and what that means about being a producer or being a songwriter is we both in order to actually get stuff, pop stuff, to get it to the artist, to the artist. Because that case, it's not really a demo that's being finished, it really is finished. Mm. I think it's a good, it's a good thing to do for people who, you know, um, don't produce. It's a good way of, of, you know, sort of fixing the problem we've just been talking about. And, and as Gary says, you don't have to, uh, you don't even have to play an instrument to be a songwriter. You know, so that's that's not what a songwriter is. Um, you know, you can just do lyrics and you can just do, you know, sort of I mean, I, I don't really like to work that way, um, but. There's a lot of there's people a, that are. There's a crap load of people that I are working like on being very successful. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm more on the producer side. I'm a songwriter too, but you know, I'm used to work like that. What sort of sense would you say you would have to produce the songwriters? Say that again? Sorry. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah. So writing to actually writing to songwriters. It's all connected. Yeah. He produces as he wrote. Yeah. I wouldn't send him a song about it. And just sign my iPhone. You would just produce it. You would always do the little fleets. Yeah. Depending. No, I mean, I prefer to produce songs that I've also been involved in writing. Because otherwise, it feels like you're doing a remix. There is a quite an interesting sort of thing you inevitably brought up, which is, you know, people doing tracks with top liners, then sort of write top line on melodies and lyrics is very, very common and it's just normal practice to do. Um, but I, there's not many people just doing top lines and sending them to track people who are putting tracks on the I don't really know why that is. I can't to start that. But people are asking for that now. No. I get a request just to send, not that I've done it. So I'm like, why would, I, why would I do that? But people ask me, can you just, have you got any just like vocals? Like this vocal track. I get this request all the time. I'm like, you know. So the beats, just quite, beats just producers just, just want, don't have any hooks? Yeah, they're like, you just have like, you know, ideas. they're basically saying, do you have any good ideas? <laughs> no, I've got a request. I get an email. I get a lot of these emails actually. Like, massive American artist working in the studio, Ryan, can't tell you who it is. But they're wondering if you have any like just really good ideas, but like, <laughs> like vocal ideas. It's like a cappella hooks. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I got loads. Who, who is but that? surely you would have loads. Surely that must happen where you 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 dance around drunk on Saturday night and you think of an idea lay it down and you can never find another idea for it. Yeah, but I'm not gonna send it to Yeah. Um, um, yeah, like into the ether. You wanna be in you wanna Babysit it and nurture. How's it going to be? Frame. How's it going to end up? What are they going to do with this idea? Just to follow up on that, if you bring to a track, and we all know that the track gets sent out to maybe 50 top liners, only one of those tracks will be the top liners is the one that is top liners selected. Do you take the top line back? This has been an interesting thing. With, with, that's a really, really good question, yeah. and that's something I've been finding, finding out about. Because this is this brave new world of people sending music to people that write lyrics and melodies and. And, you know, they might send that piece of music to 50 different people, and if they don't use the your idea, can you take your your uh, your top line back? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 personally, I wouldn't. I'd ask how many people. You know, I wouldn't write on something that's been no. sent to like a, a just a million people. But I would. I would think you, you can take your idea back. I don't. I don't know. I think it's well, it actually goes back to what you said before when when a, when. A, you need to have that discussion before you start, um, because that, the first time I learned my lesson in, in quite a big way was somebody sent me a track which I put top line on and then sent independently to um, somebody which which they wanted to then cut. And then when I, um, it was kind of a classical sort of thing. And then when I phoned the producer to say that we got cut on it, he said, oh, we can't use the track anymore, I'll leave over doing it. Um, are doing a snubber song for that and track. Song for that track, yeah. and um, and it's a nightmare, absolute nightmare. So I mean, I, I, 
you know, for that reason, like Gary, I don't, I don't write on tracks that are sent to a lot of different people. Um, but if I do write to any track, then it's something that you need to sort out before before you start, because it's pretty painful. Yeah, and before it was a little tricky, you couldn't really tell that you were sending out to many different writers, but now the label's sending it out to like 100 writers, and it's like a competition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got time for a couple more questions. You, the, I've got you over there, and you were first. Um, you Practice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I, I was saying yesterday, like I, I find really exciting now. Like I think anyone can make a, a, hit, a hit record in, in, the, in their bedroom, you know, for not a lot of money. And I've worked with people that are doing that, and it's happening time and time again. Big, big, big songs, hit productions, and songs being made, you know, for nothing on laptops, on in the back of tour buses, or in bedrooms. That's what that's the brave world, that's what's so exciting. I do think it's a level playing field. You know, anyone in this room tonight could go home and just make the tomorrow's like biggest track, you know, in their room. In, in the hotel room. Right. Yeah. And it's 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 really it's cheaper now than ever to make pop you know, pop mm. music. That, yeah, Damon yeah. Alba made that last Gorillas album in on his iPad while touring. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But it was a pretty crap record. So I think the part figure is I think that I think not. All, you, you can make it, you know, a record for, for, for not a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And it, uh, I suppose it depends what, what you're trying to do as well. I mean, you can't not an orchestral. Yeah, you can't, can't do an orchestral yeah, or, or a brass band yeah. or you know. It, it, but it's a pop it's, record. You, you it's can't. a little bit better time to record. For, it's so exciting. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I was saying this yesterday. Like the, the age of like the super producer and needing like a hundred thousand dollars to make a big record and going to a big studio for two months and yeah. have all the gear and guitar. Because, because the worst thing you want to have on a song is the pressure of time. And if you're in a studio that's costing you, you know, five thousand dollars a day, if you can sit at home for a month and work on one song, you're going to get a better result. Sure. Um, one last question. Top line is the melody and the lyrics. Um, I mean, when I, uh, you know, when I first started writing, when I was an artist. I, I wrote a lot with a guy uh, called Gary Clark, who's just an all-rounder type of guy, and I just presumed that's what a songwriter was. It wasn't until I started to kind of be a songwriter myself, uh, instead of an artist, that I realised there was sort of two different things. Um, but, you know, you get track people who just do track, and you get top liners who just do lyrics and melody. And then you get people who are, you know, track people, but have the same melody and the other way around. But it's quite common to have very common to have top liners and track people. I thought you were talking about trains, actually. <laughs> <laughs> about train tracks? Well, we're all big train enthusiasts. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing they have in common. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming to this. I hope you learnt something 
um, from today, I know I have. Um, I'm going to go home and try and write something immediately. Uh, please thank our, our panel, Fred Rowe, Gary, Adam. Thank you. Thanks.